Hi, I'm Clyde Yancey, Chief of Cardiology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here today sitting in the chair usually held by Rob Califf to moderate and direct the discussion on life and times of leading cardiologists. And the reason Rob isn't here in this seat is because he's here in the other seat. So we're interviewing Rob today, and this should absolutely be a fantastic opportunity to really enjoy the wisdom and the words of truly one of the leading cardiologists, not only in the United States, but in the world. Rob, it's really great to have well, you here. It's great to be here. A little scary, though. <laughs> a little scary. You know, why don't we just start right there. How did you come up with this idea, and how do you keep it going, life in times of leading cardiologists? Well, you know, it was really simple because um, not too long ago, Bill Roberts had a thing in the American Journal of Cardiology. You obviously very close to Bill and right. spent a number of years with him. And I, I, I used to read those uh, religiously just like a lot of other cardiologists because I think we take inspiration in people. We don't take inspiration in abstract mm -hmm. ideas. And I thought, you know, now that Bill has wound down his effort, we should go to the new medium of um, interviews, and it's been a lot of fun. So keeping it going is not hard. We just come up with interesting people, and the list is quite long. <laughs> well, it is a great idea, because if you think about the essence of medicine over the years, it's always been that establishment of legacy, connecting with those that came before you, and then leaving something for those that come after you. That's really been kind of the fraternity of medicine and your bringing this to bear, life and times of leading cardiologists, keeps that fraternal spirit gender neutral, mm. but it keeps it intact, and so that's a good thing. Usually when you have these conversations, you kind of start at the very beginning. Where is home? Where were you born? What was that whole experience like? And we shared a bit of that when our roles were reversed, but let's revisit it some, because again, we're two Southern boys here. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the beginning for you. Well, I, I do think that um, the interview I did of you was uh, very meaningful in a lot of ways, and people that have watched it uh, really enjoyed it because we grew up in similar places on opposite sides of the street right. in some ways, <laughs> and um, there's a lot to learn from that. So I'm a South Carolinian through and through. Both uh, my parents are from South Carolina. My dad uh, grew up in Charleston, which is uh, quite an interesting place, and my mom uh, grew up in the low country of South Carolina. Uh -huh. Her father was a Baptist minister. And my dad's father was um, in the Army Corps of Engineers and um, really traveled all over the world and ended up uh, settling back in, in Charleston. So I was born in Anderson, South Carolina, because there wasn't a hospital in Clemson <laughs> where my dad was um, oh. uh, on the faculty at Clemson in the architecture school. How about that? So now, um, with that kind of background, I mean, the low country famous for its cuisine and tobacco throughout the Carolinas and a dad, as a member of the Army Corps of Engineers, how does medicine <laughs> crop up out of all of that? Well, you know, it's actually, so to be clear, it's my grandfather, so my dad was an architect. Okay. And, um, you know, my parents, um, interestingly, are, you know, pretty uh, progressive. Um, and in fact, I still remember in my junior high school, uh, we lived in a place called Republican Hills. I was one of 13 in my class to vote for Kennedy over Nixon <laughs> in the, uh, mock election in that, in that famous um, election. And but you survived. <laughs> I survived. And I, you know, but I wouldn't say my parents were uh, real pro-medicine. In fact, in a way, um, they encouraged us to do whatever we wanted to do. There was a distant um, relative that had been a horse and buggy doctor in South Carolina. Oh. We actually have his picture. But, um, and his diploma from the Medical University of South Carolina yeah. in the 1800s. But, that had no influence on me, and I had no idea I was going into medicine until uh, late in my college career. <laughs> that is really fascinating. Do you think that some of those experiences, connecting with a distant relative who was the really old school classic doctor, having a grandfather that was involved in the Army Corps of Engineers, a father who was an architect, and then the idea of being kind of avant-garde how much of that factors into what you do today and the way you formulate your perspectives on medicine and healthcare? Well, I think we're all, you know, it's kind of obvious we're all a product of where we came from, and um, I'd say the history has had a huge um, influence on me, and it's given me a sense of 
continuity. I mean, so much so that I wonder about people who don't have those kinds of family connections where they got severed and, the, you know, the courage they have to uh, pick up and, and go on. Because I've, I've always been, you know, I wouldn't say I'm the most congenial, family-oriented kind of a person, and, you know, I wish I'd been better in that regard in many ways, but uh, the fabric has always been there, so it's had an influence. But, you know, um, uh, I think we gravitate to things that we feel like we're good at, and that, that's what happened to me. That's interesting. One more question along the same line of this really rich foundational experience you had with your family and extended family. If your grandfather, the gentleman in the Corps of Engineers, could come back now, I'm assuming he's not with us, but I don't know that for a fact, but if you could come back now and look at your book of business, the things that you've done now, what's the one thing that he would say, hey, that's really, that was a good idea? That's a really good question. He, he um, passed away when I was not too old, but you know, he used to take me out to play golf when I was a little kid. So knowing him, he'd probably be more interested in how my golf game was going <laughs> and uh, have, having a conversation about it. He was just a very social, outgoing um, guy, and he, he was around uh, uh, for a good part of my uh, childhood and through getting um, married, but um, he'd probably be more interested in sort of how I was getting along than any specific accomplishment that I, that I had. That's great to know. And I'm assuming that there must be some sort of interstate rivalry between South Carolina and North Carolina, but you end up in North Carolina, so how does that sojourn take place? <laughs> Well, you know, when you um, grow up in South Carolina, you think it's the center of the universe, <laughs> the great state of South Carolina, and there are a lot of really great things about it, but um, educational opportunities are significant there, and um, I thought about going to Clemson like my uh, dad did. Mm -hmm. It's a great university, but it turned out my older brother went to Duke, and um, I'd been up to visit a couple of times. 1969 was, um, you know, very tumultuous times, the time of the Vietnam War right. and all that. And I decided to apply to Duke. It seemed like a faraway place then. I'd never been on an airplane before. And um, so I, I trekked north to go to, uh, to Duke. And then, of course, as things evolved, that was the heyday of Jesse Helms uh, railing on on television about the communist um, influence on Chapel Hill and Duke University. And things sort of evolved from there. <laughs> now, talk to us about your postgraduate training and your journey onto the faculty at Duke? Well, what happened was, um, you know, I, I had a college career where, uh, frankly, the first couple of years, um, there weren't a lot of classes. Um, there was, you know, it was the time of the Vietnam War, as I mentioned. Um, I was focused on clinical psychology as a career. Okay. Um, I was very interested in uh, Eastern religion and all sorts of other things that were popular at the time. And um, I ended up getting a job in the work release section of the South Carolina State Prisons in the summer. <laughs> and um, what I came to realize fairly quickly was that um, the rewards from clinical psychology, while it's really important, and I gained a deep appreciation for it, they were sort of long term. You could spend a lot of time in that field and not get um, too much of a turnaround in terms of rewards. And in fact, I think it was the day when um, as it turned out, several of the inmates had been on high school basketball teams playing against me. And so um, I was allowed to take the bus out with the work release prisoners. We had a basketball team. And one day they picked my pocket, and I didn't realize it until we got back <laughs> um, to the prison. And, you know, if you can imagine the guts of people to pick the pocket of the person who's right. taking them out. And at that point, I decided I, I need a career with a little more tangible results, and I made the switch to medicine. But by that time, I had to take an extra year to take the uh, courses for right. medical school. I never thought I'd come back to Durham. I applied a bunch of places. Tulane actually was where I decided to go. I'd already paid my down payment when Duke <laughs> accepted me. And I still don't exactly know why, but I said, what the heck, I'll go back and try that. Well, then as it turned out, um, we didn't have a lot of money. In fact, um, we, we had just gotten married. Lydia uh, was a nurse. Um, we started out with $7 in our bank account, and our dog got run over by a car, and oh we had goodness. to borrow money to pay for the veterinarian. So I had to get a job. And it turned out um, 
I got a job um, seeing patients in the cardiology clinic and entering the data into this weird thing called a computerized database, <laughs> which didn't exist anywhere else at the time. And uh, that really that was your changed the way I was thinking. Wow. Well, you know, I have to digress, and once again, you and I have an uncanny set of parallels, because as a senior at Tulane, I was totally tapped out, basically broke. And one of the few jobs that provided any resource, particularly for a medical student, was working in the prison. So I worked in the prison several evenings a week, and you could even sleep in the prison <laughs> for a real bounty. <laughs> so many nights I would share a cell with a person who was in jail for murder, waiting to move to the state penitentiary for the obvious endpoint there. It's and amazing what you can learn in a prison. It, it is very amazing, and I would do the intake history and physical examinations for those that have been recently incarcerated, which meant I read the paper, knew what they had done, and here they are in front of me. And there were a lot of life lessons that came to bear. I think in that entire year, I only evaluated one person who had completed high school. Wow. And I thought that was the most telling statement. And it's amazing how even today, that experience, that year of intense work with people from a totally different perspective, really color some of my judgment and it's interesting that once again we have that parallel. Yeah, I did learn an, an appreciation for what people go through in their circumstances. I, I just decided I'd rather do things where I can see the benefits more quickly. And I completely agree. So now it's interesting that the nest, the nidus, for this whole clinical research enterprise had been started by somebody somehow at Duke. Do you know who that was? Of course, it was Eugene Stead. So, <laughs> Gene Stead uh, was this amazing figure who um, had, at a very young age, had been at the Brigham, was heralded as you know one of the brightest people there. Went to Emory to be chair of medicine, and it was enticed to come to Duke very quickly after being at Emory um, on the basis that you could build a system that would take care of people in a very large part of the southeast where healthcare was very much needed and that he could have a lot of freedom to do what he wanted to do to build that system, uh, which he did. He trained dozens of uh, people who went on to become chair of medicine elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And then he announced abruptly that people over age 50 couldn't come up with any good ideas and so that he announced he was going to retire from being chair of medicine at a very young age. Wow. But he also had seen what computers could do um, and uh, decided to take money that was given for monitoring patients in the coronary care unit, which was new at the time, spend it building a computerized database to measure outcomes in people with heart disease, something we take for granted now, but it just didn't exist really before then. So he really is the grandfather of this whole enterprise. Completely. Now, how much time did you spend with him as you were beginning to own this and move it forward? Well, you know, we have this curriculum at Duke uh, um, where the third year is totally devoted to research. I still don't understand why other medical schools don't do that, <laughs> but uh, we've stuck with it. And I um, decided to do uh, clinical research in cardiology, which was also uh, going against the stream because the big focus was on going into a laboratory to learn how to do basic science research. And um, it turned out I did a project where I put Holter monitors on people who were involved in this database because we thought that if you could measure the PVCs, you could tell who was going to have sudden death. That was also a very new concept. Holters were new. And uh, I spent a whole year with Dr. Stead and a crew of other people uh, thinking about how you'd use computers to measure outcomes and make decisions about how to treat people. So was that your first clinical trial? Um, well, it was, a, it was an observational study. <laughs> and, you know, the aha moment for me was when we had, you know, collected all the data. It was in a computer, which was rare at the time. Most, sure. of, most, most of what was done was done on spreadsheets by hand. And I still remember um, when we um, did the analysis, Carrie Lee, who's, of course, been one of my great colleagues, right. was a young faculty member. He said, you know, it's interesting. The PVCs do predict sudden death. But when you do the regression analysis, it's actually the left ventricular function, not the PVCs, that dominate. Now, what year was this? This would have been 1978. <laughs> and so um, we submitted an abstract, and I still remember the moment. It was at the Fountain Blue in Miami when the American Heart Association used to be there. And I stood up and presented our data, and I said, it's not 
the ventricular arrhythmias, it's a left ventricular function. And if you want to develop therapies to prevent sudden death, you should focus on left ventricular function. And I was ridiculed. I mean, it was, I felt destroyed. It was like, you stupid idiot. You know, how could you even believe this? But that and is so a, classic for the pioneer. <laughs> and then, of course, it turned out, where do ICDs work? Right. Well, they work in people with impaired LV function, because that's really um, the key factor. So I learned so much from that experience, and it was inspirational. To so when was the first time you did something that involved a placebo group, a randomized <laughs> control trial? Well, What's you know, that story? You know, I'd, I'd gone off to UCSF to do my internship and residency and came back and was in the fellowship working on the database. and. We thought this thing called a clinical trial would be interesting. So actually my first study was a placebo-controlled beta blocker study in the coronary care unit, which I ran. But you know, at the time, if you were a Duke doctor, you didn't need randomized trials because since you were a Duke doctor, you knew the right treatment. That was <laughs> Are we putting that basis. on film? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what people really believed. And you know, to this day, I think a lot of people still believe that doctors are somehow imbued with this great ability to figure out what the right thing to do is when of course, I've learned that's probably not the case, and you know. So we did a placebo. I participated as a site in a clinical trial, um, but you know, in that vein, when I was a third-year student, I'll never forget the moment Dr. Stead took me aside and he said, "There's a pay with the, go to the cath conference, and they're going to show a patient with multivessel disease and LV dysfunction, and they're going to look at it together, and everybody's going to conclude medical therapy is best because the last three patients who went to surgery died." Um, uh, in the operating room. But let me show you the last hundred patients medically treated and surgically treated, and the surgical patients do better over time. But they're not going to think about that because they're reacting to the last couple of people they saw instead of what the overall outcome is. It's exactly what happened. It was a great lesson in how as clinicians we get deluded by things that stick in our mind instead of what the data really show. That's incredible. I know you, and one of your strongest gifts is your humility, and I know that you'll never trumpet DCRI as it should be, but it really is an amazing entity within the landscape of not just cardiovascular medicine, but organized medicine. And I think many of us owe you and your team at DCRI so much <coughs> for giving us the sophistication, so clearly an amazing success, and you should be congratulated. But the question I have for you is, how did the growth take place? Did it just become embryonic and move forward? Was it serendipity? Did you have to really wrestle with people? Or did Dr. State give you the template? Well, it's always been that serendipity, but you know, the Boy Scout motto and all, and that uh, you know, you need to be prepared. Right. And now we have Coach K at Duke, who's, whose whole story is, it's a preparation that matters so much more than anything else right. about success. and. You know, I'll try to be brief um, uh, about this, but um, you know, so we had this database, we were collecting outcomes, and it really became evident to a lot of us that you could uh, monitor treatment, you could begin to look at quality, but if you really wanted to know when there was a modest treatment effect, which most treatments have, modest effects, that you needed to randomize. And so along came that miraculous moment in coronary care when several people, including Marcus DeWood and the folks in Germany, showed that there was clot in the coronary artery. For young people, they still don't believe this, but when I was a student, I was taught that blood clot did not cause heart attacks. But we saw there was clot, and we saw you could lyse the clot. And my friend Eric Topol, who had been an intern when I was a resident at UCSF, had gone to Hopkins as a fellow, and he had access to the um, thoughts about TPA as a new uh, biologic agent. And we said, let's do some clinical trials. <laughs> At the time, there was a thing called the Timmy Group, which was the establishment <laughs> funded by the NIH. And we said, let's form a group, and we'll call it Tammy, <laughs> just to spoof the uh, Timmy Group. And we marched out to Genentech and spoke to the head of R&D then, Elliot Grossbard, and said, we want to do a clinical trial because we think doing an angioplasty after lysis is going to do better. And he said, um, basically, we're already working with the establishment, but you know, I sort of like you guys. We'll give you some free drug and a little bit of money. So for about $100,000, we did TAMI-1, randomized over 300 patients, did serial casts. And we used, I, what I had was a database. Eric, of course, had the charisma and the drive to make a lot of things happen. I still remember when Carrie Lee pressed a button, because none of us knew, you know, we did the trial properly. 
it came out exactly the opposite of what we expected. <laughs> and, you know, it was sort of a state of panic. But again, we learned that um, you do randomized trials for a reason, it's that you don't really know the answer. And um, so that was Tammy one. We then did a series of trials, and it was really just friends who had been house staff together, Barry George, Dean Kariakas, Joe Samaha in Memphis. We had a little group. We even early on used to fly in an airplane to meet together after an interesting case just to figure out how you do it. And Bill O'Neill, of course, was a key figure with Richard Stack um, at our place. Well, then after a while, um, the Italians did the big mega trial and found that TPA was not better than streptokinase in their mega trial. And there was a need to do a, a comparative trial with um, the dosing of TPA that we were using. There had never been a U.S.-based mega trial. And Genentech came to us because we had the experience and the friendship and said, why don't you run it as an independent academic trial? So we went from doing 500 patients in a study to 41,000 <laughs> overnight. And that built an enterprise. So then now with um, the enterprise built and a big trial under our belt, the question was, um, how do you, what do you do next? And what I was by then passionate that this was not something that should be limited to coronary care or even cardiology. Um, we're so often wrong in what we believe about treatments that we need everyone to be thinking about integrating clinical trials into right. practice. The institution backed it up, but there was so much controversy, it was only after McKinsey had come in and done a, thor done a thorough evaluation and concluded that you needed to create this entity that was part of the university but had separate rules so it could mm -hmm. be protected. It's now, of course, what we call an innovation envelope in companies. The other small part of the story is I was um, recruited to go two places, back to South Carolina or to the Bay Area where I had been. Big jobs in both places and it actually turned out that it became a political issue between Democrats and Republicans about <laughs> where the enterprise would stay. And uh, we ended up staying at Duke and it's been, it's been a great career. Um, it's been career. a great run, great run. You know, this is a bit of a tangential question, but if there's anyone in cardiovascular medicine that can really understand the correct interface between industry and investigators, it ought to be you or someone involved in DCRI. You know that's one of the friction points in today's community. What are you, what's your viewpoint based on the history you have with appropriate relationships with industry that generate good data? Well, th there are two points of friction that are tra a tragedy right now in the, in the United States medicine, I think, that are actually holding us back um, in terms of the potential we have to improve um, health. One is the industry um, academic um, interface. You know, this view that industry is bad and that the people in industry are bad, it's absurd. Or the view that academics should only do ivory tower sorts of things. You know, the joke I like to tell is when I went from being coronary care unit director to being vice chancellor for clinical research, my kids looked up academic in the dictionary and it means of theoretical interest but of no practical value. <laughs> but you know, I, I think when you do clinical research, it is worthless unless you're either really advancing knowledge or doing something that leads to improved health outcomes. And you do that by using the tools of industry and collaboration. And so the whole key is what are the rules of collaboration? And I think what we have to stick to in academia is the independence, the ability to publish, the ability to analyze on our own. What industry needs to stick to is focusing on developing products that are useful to people. The marriage of those two is wonderful when it happened. I mean, we just finished these two big trials in atrial fib, Aristotle and Rocket. Right. Um, you know, we had the databases, we did the analysis, but they were simultaneously done by our industry colleagues. Um, I think it's worked out great and there'll be big um, appropriate advances. The other source of friction, which I think is even more severe right now, and you and I were in a meeting talking about this, is if we don't move to a learning health system, we will have lost an amazing opportunity. And while all the rhetoric and the theory is now completely in line, if you go make rounds in our best academic institutions today, you see clinicians who are under tremendous pressure to produce a productivity metrics with almost no attention to advancing knowledge right. in the context of their practice. So we've got to make those interfaces work, and it's, it's a key issue. You just introduced another area that I wanted to go with you, Rob, talking about making rounds, and before that, discussing how you had been the director of the coronary care unit. I had a chance to query a couple of your own 
peers and faculty members at Duke and said, hey, I'm talking to Rob. Any question you want me to bring about, they're all benign. Nothing that's <laughs> going to make you sweat. But uh, our mutual good friend, Magnus Oman, said, you know, it's interesting to think that Rob continues around in the critical care unit. He sees patients. How does your mental matrix work when you think about all the experiences, the clinical trials, the shortcomings, everything that you understand about clinical practice guidelines and how they're put together? Now you have to deduce everything, process and data, and help formulate a treatment plan for the patient. How does it impact you as a clinician? <laughs> Well, you know, I've been thinking about this for decades because I've always done research as part of um, practice. And, and, what our, and, and running a coronary care unit, you know, the last thing that a patient or family needs is a doctor who's indecisive and appears to be paralyzed by all of the information. And so, you know, I think it's really critical that we divide our medical actions into things that we know we should do. There are not that many of them, but we ought to do those reliably uh, through engineering process to make sure that we don't miss it, like giving aspirin to people right. with a heart attack and so on and so forth. And then there's most of what we do where we really don't know. And there I think um, we sort of need to be old fashioned, stay within the bounds, but um, people want their doctors to help them make good decisions. And the more critically ill they are, the more the locus of control, of course, is with the doctor as opposed to with the patient. The more we're in the outpatient arena, I think that's quite different. And there I think the role is to say, you know, we're not really sure. Let me tell you about what the options are and you apply your values to it. In critical care, you know, it's really, you know, someone comes in, they got an acute problem, you got to do what you think is best and you just cannot be paralyzed. And in fact, one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of my colleagues in the quantitative sciences um, tend to get paralyzed when they're in clinical situations. And it's understandable because sure. Most things we do, we don't really know if it's right. No, I remember having a conversation with one of my own mentors who really seemed to be very accomplished. And when we had a similar discussion, he said, you know, Clyde, it's when you know a fair amount about a subject that you realize how much you really don't know. And I think you just articulated that yet again. And you know, one other principle just um, that, I, that I've uh, always held to, in the intensive care situation, or most of the inpatient situations, you should really trust the nurses and the physician's assistants and nurse practitioners. You know, so you do what you think is best, but when they question it, you should back <laughs> you off should and, and rethink it. In the outpatient arena, when you're seeing someone with elective decisions, you should trust the patient. You should give them the information as best you can, and then your job is to help them be at peace with the decisions that they make. Yeah, Osla said, if you just but listen to the patient, the patient will tell you what to do. Another question that came up from your, your own peer, the peers, this comes from uh, Bob Harrington. He said, you know, a guy that's done as much as Rob, I'd really like to know the road not taken. Was there something that sticks in his mind that says, gosh, I only wish I'd have gone down that path or made that decision? So is there an answer to that? What's the road not taken for Rob Califf? Well, you know, it's interesting Bob would ask that question because he, he's a guy who's got a lot of options in his life and a lot to think about in terms of what uh, he might do right. and in, in some ways um, facing very similar issues that, that I've faced. Um, I, you know, there's not one specific um, example, but I'd say in general, I've always had a choice between um, staying where I am and trying to advance in an area where the knowledge is just exploding and globalizing all at the same time, where there's more than you can do in 24 hours by far, or going for more of what I would call a typical leadership position, like a dean or something like that. And you know, I've looked at those kinds of jobs and sometimes I've not been interested, sometimes they've not been interested in me. <laughs> um, and and I, I think probably in the long run, uh, my personality is better suited for the creativity that you can have when you're not tied down in one of the traditional leadership positions where you've got to be politically um, less out on a limb, typically. I don't know if you agree or disagree that that's an issue. You, you're now in a very traditional, important leadership position, and I've got nothing against that. But you know, I'd say that's been the big issue for me that I've always um, struggle with because you get labeled. You know, for example, I get labeled as not being interested in basic science. Well, that's not <laughs> true, but you know, a big part of my job is to stand up for the fact that if we don't um, do the clinical research, the basic science will in essence be wasted because we're not going to make um, the advances. And sometimes that 
leads to skirmishes <laughs> along the boundaries there. No, I agree on one thing that I think is very important. In the space of leadership, people who hold those titles have to be willing to think provocatively and differently at all times because what really makes the label stick is if you stay closely to the phenotype. But if you're willing to think very expansively, then I think it's a different experience. Two final questions. One on the personal side and one on the professional side, and you can address them in whichever order. But from the personal side, for you and your life experiences, I know you enjoy basketball still, and I know golf is a passion. What are the life lessons that you've learned from your embrace of sports in general, or particularly either basketball or golf, that really help you get through the day and be at ease with the things you have to do? Well, I, I mean, to me, sports is really more of an escape than um, specific lessons, but the principles of sports, when at their best, and we, of course, now in an era where we're seeing some of the worst of what can happen in sports with um, the Penn State situation, et cetera, um, you know, you have a set of rules that you can play by, and the best person wins the game. But then the game's over, and you go on to the next game. Yeah. And you know, I learned that in Little League Baseball, where I still uh, remember I didn't make the team when I was nine years old. My mother got on the phone, and I heard her berating the coaches. Next thing I knew, I was on the team. <laughs> but we lost every game that year. But I still had a great time, because you'd, the game would be over, and you'd get ready for the next game. And I, I do think that's um, a critical lesson in sports. And in the kind of sports, the two, distinguishing basketball and golf is really interesting because basketball is all about the team. And Coach K, of course, makes that, um, that case probably better than anyone. Right. Golf is more about um, understanding yourself and being uh, at peace. And so, of course, there are always um, lessons. Um, and for me, learn. golf is about accepting your own limitations. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the last question. Um, for the incipient academic investigator who really is looking forward to a career as an investigator, even though both of us are over 50 and Dr. Stead would say we don't have the ability to generate <laughs> any novel thoughts, um, give it a shot. What are the two or three things you would tell the incipient investigator who's embarking upon this career path? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a little expansively here for a minute because um, it, it is a, it, it's a meaningful time for me in terms of where I am with a lot of different things right now. And I, I would say the number one thing for me is um, humility. And um, you get humbled by a lot of things in life. Um, and I, I think my family has been the source of the most humility. Because I come home, you know, and uh, Lydia, uh, who, you know, we've been married many, many years, married in 1973. Get so, it right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she's not particularly interested in my greatest triumph in the research arena. She wants to know, you know, what am I doing in real life? Mm -hmm. And that brings me down to earth and has uh, repetitively um, over all these years. And so humility there, but also with your kids, as, yeah. as you know. Um, you see things happen with your kids, and we've been through a lot with our kids. They've all ended up uh, being great. And, uh, you know, my uh, older daughter uh, actually working at the DCRI on a diabetes <laughs> trial where I'm the global PI is really fascinating and my two sons who are engineers with um, one in aerospace and one looking to um, go into medicine now at a relatively late age. Um, but So I think being grounded um, in your family is really critical, but it's also very hard because the demands if you want to succeed are extraordinary. For me it was never the external demands as much as I was so excited about what we were doing. I'd sometimes lose track of you know, other things in life that were important. So uh, humility, um, always striving to seek the balance. You know, I like to say it is kind of like marriage. You never get it quite right. You just have to keep <laughs> working on it and hoping the other partner will continue to negotiate as you, uh, as you go through life. And then I think integrity, which is a huge issue right now. It's well known, I'm, um, and, and I'll be on 60 Minutes soon about this, that I'm spearheading an effort to deal with a tragic case we had where um, there were difficulties with genomic data in cancer at our institution. Um, and it, it took me all the way back to my daughter who had con has congenital heart disease, had surgery um, when I was an intern, huge operation, great cardiology care at UCSF, but it turned out her primary cardiologist was a fake doctor. And, uh, you know, 
So I think you can even be really good at something, but from my perspective, uh, you know, at the end of the game, you know, when you call it quits, the only thing you've really got is your integrity. And that, that's a lesson I've learned over and over. And then the final thing I'd point out, and I think this has been a key to a lot of what success I've had, and it's also hard to be perfect in this. I'm not, in none of this am I saying that I have gotten it right. It's just something to strive for. You know, when you meet people and you work with them, uh, you form friendships. And for someone like me, I'm overwhelmed with a number of friends, and it's a struggle to keep up with people. But I think they know it if you're listening to them, and if they need something and they let you know, you maybe don't spend as much time with your other friends, but you take care of the issue, even if it's not in your direct interest. You know, they want to go somewhere else to a great job. Yeah. Okay, well, if it's best for them, it's probably going to work out best for you, too. So I think um, this thing of being loyal to people over time for all their faults and giving them a break is the other thing I'd really stress. Rob, that was beautiful. I wouldn't even try to paraphrase it. I think the words you used were so incredible. And for the incipient professional, regardless of clinical investigation, I think you gave us some brilliant advice. You know, as I listen to you, I think the real joy of doing an interview like this is to understand the imperfectness of all of us and how there is something so engaging about it and it keeps us connected, it draws us in, and it really builds that incredible legacy that gets back to what we talked about in the beginning, that fraternal spirit of medicine. And this has really been a great moment to share that with you. Yeah, you know, Clyde, um, uh, this, this uh, statement that, that got, you know people in the South use all the time, we are all sinners, there is no <laughs> doubt about it. And if you can't forgive sinners, um, yeah, I think you're in the wrong place. And there's also the ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Right. Um, Holly Smith, who really, other than Dr. Stead, in terms of big people in medicine, Holly's still around at UCSF. He was my chair of medicine. Yeah. And um, he, he uh, gave a talk not too long ago called Academic Sex. And what he was saying was, you know, part of your job if you're a leader is to look at the people who came before you and look at the people who are going to follow because they're going to do the greatest things. And you want to have progeny. And you got to look out for those progeny just like uh, your own children. That's great. It's been a blast, Rob. Thanks, Clyde. Always a blast. Thank you so much. This is Clyde Yancey here with the heart.org having the incredible privilege of bringing you life and times of leading cardiologists with one of the true leading cardiologists in our world today, Rob Califf. Thank you so much for your time and attention.